this gentleman coming to stage now has been writing poetry since a girl broke up with him. Hey, what else causes New Jersey guys like him to express himself in free verse? He recently had his 1989 chapbook, In Search of a Voice, reissued through the wonder of P.O.D. Yeah, Pod, Pod Publishing. And is planning on releasing a second book that he has completed back in 1990, entitled When the Sun Sets in the East, early, either uh, later this year or early next year, again through the wonders of Pod Publishing. His book of humorous memoirs, My Imaginary Friend Was Too Cool to Hang Out With Me, <laughs> it's a fabulous book, uh, was published by Aberdeen Press this year. Um, this gentleman is a regular at Tasty Words, although it's the first time he's done poetry here. And um, he's, his book that I just mentioned will be for sale at an intermission, but right now he's here to read some poems. Please welcome my dear friend, Charles Freerichs. Archaeologist at age six. My mother said there was a cesspool buried in our backyard. Armed with spade and rake, I spent a summer digging, hoping to find a diving board. Lost watches and coins, the concrete edge of the pool, the hot dog stand. Even now, knowing the truth, I walk the backyard dreaming of the young men and women in their bathing suits. <laughs> Conversation held in a 1966 Ford Galaxy. <laughs> Clouds came. Trees shook off the frost. How long, I asked, knowing it upset him. But I was the one with his name, the one who would take the mantle. Even at ten, I needed to know. Mama will be first. She'll live another ten years, maybe. Then Grandpa. Then Granny. She's still got some wear on her, he said, as if talking about the tires. <laughs> The drizzle muddied a veneer of dust over the windshield. Winter was still new, not yet the drape that fell again and again while we drove further into the dark. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Moving on to adulthood. <laughs> it's called Memories of Our Georgetown House. Cars turned to mounds of linen in the gauze of snow that bandages street fissures. Trees wear pajamas of white and bear the snowfalls rustle, casting echoes on the buried path prints. We snap icicles from the pane to let them fall, gouges on the stoop's flesh of slush. Innocence is a veneer of snow we brush off, like overcoats and underthings in the sheen of our lust. We cling to the dream of each other, trace veins on our wrists. Twelve candles circle a plate. Champagne is choked from a toothpaste glass. Feel that? You hold your palm a quarter inch from my face. Can you feel me? Now six years gone, I eye the sleet sprawl, bleached like cotton in the ink of air. It beds in a crib of earth. Our D.C. house is let. All we knew then done, our touch, our sweat, our old wounds. Do you recall how we killed the child I was in that December storm in the steam of our Georgetown room? This is called The Breath of New Jersey. I still know the breath of New Jersey, the tin pan howl of Conrail freights that slash the air with warning strobes like machetes at the stalks of dark, then burst onto the Madison Street grade, each locomotive larger than the food town and blacker than a spade in inklets of dust. Night sinks quickly in New Jersey atop the wailing tractor trailers, swimming turnpikes, spastic, chilled to the frame, fighting upstream like salmon to spawn their loads in Newark, Patterson, and Hackensack. Stone cities gone ash in fields of weed that crust their factories like barnacles on blue whale's snout. Look to the rivers of pitch for the detritus we spit out. In New Jersey, the leaves all wear a tired film of smoke while new homes are jammed on back lawns and front lawns and side lawns of lots which were drawn for one original house. Acorns flock like marbles to curbstone gutters where dog turds cure and cigarette butts turn to rust while grayish rain sizzle clouds and storm whistles rooftops. This is New Jersey. Leave it alone. Leave us. You must. 
On my ears I still sense the flush of the brook snake washed around the pines where geese chase field mice that climb periwinkle to the banks, and the wind, the wind, the hollow wind, that crone, that harbor breath of voice that billows the panes and knocks storm winds to rattle, New Jersey's children's dreams of when the snow grows thick and bake like kitchen radio screech, 1010 WINS News, the following schools will be closed, and old men tremble, scrape powder from their windshields, drop salt to their drives. By afternoon, the white sheen of the lawn's gone gray, and the children don't see, and their mothers won't see, and their fathers can't see that there is death in New Jersey, where the rarity in the overpeck and the Passaic, her veins opened up, left scabbed, mired, and stained, where the sanitation trucks gnaw their trash each Thursday before dawn, then heave it into the Meadowlands ponds. I hear the crack snap as a neighbor touches match to his piled leaves, and somehow with the rush of that smoke, the ache of that train, and the hymn of that wind, it's hard to forget a place like that. Okay, let's go back to whimsical. <laughs> Maybe I ordered these wrong. <laughs> Her red sweatshirt. It shimmers like wax paper and hangs on the bedpost. Its wrinkles covered by suede jabs of light from Montgomery Ward waffle curtains. It is a lost skin that echoes the pumping and swings a sleeve over her face when the motions all stop. This is called The Furnace That Crept. As I remember, each riser spoke in order from the cellar, giving under his black weight. Then down the hallway he'd stalk to the bedrooms in the back and through my door. When my eyes were shut, you cannot kill the dead. He would move on to the radiator sit there until I accepted my death, then evaporate until the steam rose into the pipes again. This is called The Transfer. Um, I actually wrote this at NYU. I dreamt you had left and were laughing at me for still standing alone in a place reserved for two, but I woke and kissed your face and you rose with me to celebrate again you couldn't, or I couldn't, and then we were on the road with your plane and your snooze school as your morning and my house and job as mine, but you smelled the same as you did in Georgetown. Still had trouble adjusting the car seat. I held your secrets for you, a promise, maybe always, and I wish I had known that was the last time that I would kiss you, hold you while you held me. I came to visit, you pecked me on a cheek hello like my father's aunt and called to someone off stage, and I faced the audience alone. <laughs> uh, visiting one of the lake cities at the top of New York State. The facades of painted wraparound porches open to streets choked on cars, caked with salt stubble beards. Rochester is built with streets of dollhouses. Modeler's snow freezes upon each slate roof. In your room, you clasp a necklace, its gold charm cut in the shape of a sponge. Two years since our breakup, you brush dust from the charm I hide in my body. Only the seasons are immutable. Thaw follows ice, ice follows thaw. Drenched in steam, we lie upon your sleigh bed. The snow flurries outside as if the world has just been shaken. At your sill, I watch a fruit fly. Unaware of glass, it beats its body into the window as if the possibility of escape were as important as escape itself. And uh, one last one. We go way back to childhood. It's called The Bully. It was in a dream that at last I smashed Kevin in the face. <laughs> the town tormentor from up the hill, the truck-like thug who at seven grew a belly and waited only until 10 to first show a five o'clock shadow. <laughs> I wondered if he knew he was a bully. Did he think himself that when he lit a firecracker in the ass of his own cat? I remember how Kevin bounded up our stoop and stood outside the screen door, his face doused, glistening, the cleavage of his buttock pushed itself above his jeans like pears rotting in the sun. He asked if I would come out and play. 
He was pained as if he did not want to be bullied. Being the neighborhood executioner caused him anguish, and when he held my head down to drown me in the brook, he felt his own lungs explode and begged me to seek revenge. But even at nine, I already knew what was and what wasn't my part in this game. Charles Freeman.